Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Gal Sagi from Huawei European Research Center. Uh, with me presenting today, uh, Ron Gampel, uh, also from Huawei European Research Center, and uh, Mali from AW Cloud. Uh, we are going to present uh, Project Dragonflow. Uh, anyone heard about the project before here? Okay. Um, we won't be able to cover all the technicalities in 40 minutes, but uh, our goal in this presentation is to show you that Dragonflow is definitely a project uh, that is interesting. It's something that you should uh, check out. Uh, and you can come uh, talk with us. Dragonflow is part of uh, OpenStack Big Tent, so we have our own design summit sessions, and you can come talk with us and get a little deeper uh, into the project. Dragonflow was created when we received uh, feedback from uh, running OpenStack public cloud at scale, at large scale, and when I mean scale, I mean many hypervisors. Uh, it's moving. It's moving. Uh, and uh, Dragonflow mission is to overcome some of the challenges that we found in the reference implementation today in terms of uh, performance of the data plane, but more importantly in the scale of the control plane and how many hypervisors uh, we can support. One uh, major objective of Dragonflow is to keep everything simple and lightweight uh, in terms of the code base. Uh, we are doing everything as part of the OpenStack project, and as I mentioned before, we are a big tent project. You will see throughout this presentation that in Dragonflow, we focus on distributed networking services. We are reusing a lot of other open source uh, framework and components that are production grade, that are production grade ready. Uh, instead of trying to reinvent uh, many of the things, and we'll see this going in this presentation. So our Dragonflow environment looks like, uh, looks like this. We have a local Dragonflow controller sitting at each of the compute nodes in our setup, and all of these controllers are synchronized with a logically centralized uh, distributed database. And this, one second, can you do something? Uh, and this database uh, holds uh, policy level uh, information. So two points, two important points about, uh, about this overview. First is that the database, and I'll touch this going forward, is a pluggable database, okay? So we can use any key value uh, database framework out there uh, to, with Dragonflow, and I'll mention uh, in a few seconds why this is important. The other important point is that this database holds policy level uh, abstractions and information uh, and not anything uh, else, which makes, first it makes the data that is being distributed to all the compute nodes relatively small, and second it lets us uh, compile or have smart logic in the compute nodes that knows to take this policy and translate it uh, according to the hardware that is running or the solution that is running on the edge, on the compute nodes. Uh, and this makes it very easy for us to do uh, smart integration with smart NICs and all kinds of hardware offloads uh, capabilities. So going a little deeper inside uh, how Dragonflow looks like, we have the pluggable database and we already have support for various different databases like uh, RamCloud, RefingDB, Redis, Zookeeper. Uh, and the process of adding uh, a database to work with Dragonflow is relatively very easy. We found that uh, doing this layer pluggable is not something that is too complicated. And on the other side, we have the Dragonflow applications, which are very flexible models that take this policy and translate it into an open flow uh, pipeline that is installed in the local OVS or any other uh, switch that might be there. Another small thing to notice about the diagram is that in addition to the database part, we're also uh, doing a, a pub-sub uh, abstraction, a pluggable pub-sub. Uh, we recognize as we moved along in the project that uh, some databases don't have an efficient publish-subscribe 
some database don't have it at all. And we wanted to optimize these two uh, separately, so it's very flexible to the user. If your database support uh, something that notifies changes, you can use it. If it doesn't, you can use something else. Um, and that helps to uh, achieve the scale that we are looking for. Some of the features that we have uh, done for Mitaka, so we have layer two uh, implemented with all the common tunnel, <coughs> all the common, in, sorry, <coughs> all the common tunnel in protocols. Uh, we have distributed layer three uh, done only on OVS flow, so no agents, no namespaces. Uh, we have a distributed DHCP application, which I'll touch in a second. Uh, the pluggable. Uh, databases and the pluggable uh, pub-sub mechanism. We already have uh, a nice integration uh, with OVS connection tracking support for security groups, so we removed the need to use the Linux bridge, and we have some nice uh, design there that uh, actually reduce the number of flows needed to implement security groups. Distributed NAT is, uh, if you're familiar with it, from the reference implementation, if your compute node has a NIC to the external public network, uh, you can use your DNAT traffic. Your DNAT traffic doesn't need to <coughs> traverse the network node. So the pluggable database framework. This is actually a very critical point in Dragonflow, uh, and this is a critical point in our view in how you scale an environment. So the first thing we did is we said, okay, Let's try to implement something of our own, something that we can optimize for our use cases. And we actually consulted uh, many people that work with us that are very familiar with DB. Uh, we would even call them DB experts. And they said, ah, this is very bad. This is all of your requirements, the high availability, the redundancy, the supporting the scale that you need. And having this consistent enough will make uh, will be very long to implement. It will be very long to implement, but even longer to productize. And this is something that uh, we couldn't uh, wait for. And then we said, okay, we can pick one solution. There are some many open source alternatives out there, uh, but we didn't want to lock ourselves uh, to one solution over the other. Uh, each solution has its own characteristic. Each solution can fit to different environments. Uh, and we said, let's try to take the pluggable, uh, the pluggable path. And we found that it's rather simple. So instead of locking us down, maybe in a few months, there will be this greatest database solution. So why, why lock ourselves to one solution? And we went and implemented this in a pluggable way. And in the, in the first implementation, what we did is we distribute all the policy, all the data to all the compute nodes. This is not the current implementation in Dragonflow. Uh, this was just the initial version. Uh, what the current implementation in this release in Dragonflow is something that we call selective proactive. Uh, what we recognize is that with large environments, uh, when you have tenant isolation, you don't really need to uh, you don't really need to send all the information to all the compute nodes. So we only send the relevant information to each compute node. And just to uh, have a quick example of why this works, we can see in this example that we have two uh, OpenStack networks, and these networks are totally isolated, right? VMs from one network can't reach VMs uh, from another. And in this setup, we have two compute nodes each has only VMs from one network. Um, so it's obvious from this example that compute node one only needs to get the topology information of network one. It doesn't need to get everything else. And this reduces the load on how we publish, subscribe uh, changes to the environment. Another nice thing uh, is the pluggable uh, PubSub. If you look, this is a common uh, OpenStack cloud environment. You have many uh, AP and Neutron API servers, uh, usually in active-active mode. Uh, and they're all talking with uh, all the local controllers. Each one can receive uh, an API change and needs to transfer this change to the, uh, to the controller. 
Uh, Mali will touch in a second. This is very important to keep all of this uh, consistently and send this information in a reliable way, uh, and we did it. The important thing to note is that we abstract this from the database because uh, the database uh, require some characteristic, but sometimes publish subscribe uh, require others, so we didn't want to, we wanted to be able to optimize them separately. I'm going to touch with a little example uh, of a networking service that we implemented in Dragonflow distributed DHCP. So if you're familiar with the reference implementation, uh, the reference implementation adds uh, a DHCP namespace at the network node for each uh, network, uh, which means if you have 10 tenants, each with 100 networks, you have 1,000 of these namespaces in the network node, and all the DHCP traffic is traversing to these uh, network nodes. Uh, and that's without talking about high availability namespaces and redundancy for this. In Dragonflow, we, we decided to, to, to take a different approach. We have all of this DHCP information in the database. We can add this to the policy and essentially send this to all the local compute nodes and have a DHCP applications that answer uh, DHCP offers and acts. Um, and it's, it's, uh, if you look at the implementation, it's relatively very easy. Uh, and it's very easy to implement networking services like that. But the point that I wanted to make uh, in this slide, and this is just an example, we are building this very nice infrastructure in Dragonflow that you have the database, you have this uh, mechanism that knows to distribute relevant information to all the compute nodes. We get the high availability of running another controller. And we have this uh, infrastructure, and when you're writing your networking services, it makes life very easy. You don't need to worry about all the other, all the high availability things, all the how information is dispatched to all the compute nodes, uh, how can they sync uh, between each other. You have this very nice infrastructure, and we are stabilizing it to make it to uh, speed up the development of distributed networking services. I'll hand over now to Mali that is going to show a uh, user uh, point of view on Dragonflow. Hello. So hello everyone, I'm Lima and I'm working for AW Cloud. So AW Cloud is a pure OpenStack player in China and we help our enterprise customers to design, build and operate OpenStack Clouds from 2012. And so currently we ha we've already built several large clouds in China, scaling from 500 to more than 2,000 physical nodes. So, so here is an example, a typical large-scale deployment for us. Uh, it is a public cloud for local enterprise in China, and uh, we cooperated with Gaoxin Yiyun and Dell and Intel in, for this deployment. And it, the data center are located in Guizhou province in China, which is the heart of the big data industry in China. And uh, we have to more than 2,500 physical servers deployed in the data center. And so far, we have 500 physical servers have been virtualized by our OpenStack distribution. So it is a large scale cloud we deployed. So here are several pictures which are taken in and uh, around the data centers. So for us, we have several large scale deployments and uh, in order to run these open stack, these large open stack clouds successfully, we have our uh, requirements is that uh, each component in open stack installations are scalable and reliable. So it is very important for us. So especially for those networking part. So currently we use Neutron OVS plugin, and, but as workloads increase, we discovered some several limitations in our deployments. The first is messaging. Okay. The, fir the first is messaging, 
and uh, I have already shared something in Vancouver Summit and uh, I did, did, uh, when I was in Vancouver and I presented a distributed messaging system for OpenStack. So if any, any of you are interested in distributing the messaging and you can find the video in YouTube. So another stuff is the persistent high available database. So it is very critical for almost all the OpenStack components is the database layer. So if the, your database layer cannot scale out as your cloud grows, you may run into major issues with the rest of your OpenStack deployments. So the database layer is very critical. So uh, as for me, I think that uh, if any component of your OpenStack installation cannot scale out, so the whole systems cannot scale out. So, so for the persistent storage in OpenStack, so currently OpenStack use use rational database measurement system heavily. So, but the rational but the the rational semantics is too strong for cloud and scout applications. We discovered a st critical performance loss due to the rational sy semantics. So according to our experience, we believe that centralized database clustering cannot practically scout in data center size. So we need a distributed data storage system for OpenStack which is optimized for read and which can be reached a consistent state for the whole system and which is always high availability, high available, and which is also able to work properly on the network partition. So these are our requirements for the data storage for OpenStack. So uh, there are two kind of data storage systems, basically. The acid system, which has uh, strong semantics, for example, the rational database, and the base system, which is almost like the NoSQL servers, which is uh, key, stores, key value stores. So according to our experiments, we prefer base systems for data backends. The base is basically means uh, basically available, which has a soft state, and which is eventual consistent. So of course there are many options for this kind of data store systems. So as described before, in Dragonflow we implemented a pluggable key value interface layer which can plug the, uh, which can plug some the, the uh, almost all the key value data stores. For example, currently we supported etcd RAM Cloud, Zookeeper, Redis. So far, the Dragonflow has a scalable persistent storage which doesn't rely on the rational database. So is, is it enough? So the persistent storage is scalable and reliable because we take advantage of these uh, NoSQL solutions rather than using the rational database. So the answer is no. So in our production system, we also discovered there is a common problem almost for all the SDN solutions, all the third party SDN solutions that if you need to integrate with OpenStack Neutron, which is the database consistency problem. So in OpenStack, the, the Neutron server uses the rational database to store all the network policies. And for all the other SDN solutions, they all have their own data, data their own data stores. For example, the Open Control, the Open Daylight, the Middle Net, and also the Dragonflow. We use, these SDN solutions are all use key value stores. So here is the problem. We have two kind of distinct type of data stores. The rational database for Neutron Server and the the key value stores for SDN controller. So how to make sure the two kind of data stores are always consistent? 
So this is a huge challenge. So the, the neutron database is the original database which has a strong semantics and uh, which stores the whole virtualized network topology for OpenStack. And uh, on the other hand, the Dragonflow database is a key value store. It is a distributed database and it stores a part of the topology that is used in Dragonflow. So here are some problems that we discovered in the production system. For, for, for example, when Neutron database transaction is committed, but the related operations on distributed database have failed. So it, it is clear that the two databases are, in, uh, are, non, are not consistent. And the problem too, so when we concurrently run multiple Neutron API on a given Neutron object, the neutron database can deal with it very, very well because due to its uh, rational nature, but how about the key value stores? And the problem three is that the neutron, as you all know, the neutron use nested transactions heavily. So how about Dragonflow database? How to translate these rational nested transactions into the key store semantics, key value semantics? So there are many, many problems because of the two database are distinct. So here are some options that which can help to enhance the consistency of the two database. The first one is, okay, we just use one database and we remove the Neutron database. So actually it is a very complicated solution, especially when involving ML2. So, and it cannot be done in a short period of time. And the next one is we introduce the key value store into Neutron, but uh, there are also some problems because Neutron had coded in a, an original manner, so how to work with SQL Alchemy. It uh, still needs much time on evaluation and deep discussion in the community. So is there any other simple and straightforward solutions that which can make the two database always consistent. So in Dragonflow, we introduced a distributed lock for, co for coordinating the two, two, two type of transactions in the, in the database. And it guarantees the automaticity of a given API and uh, it implemented in the Neutron core plugin layer. So it is a project-based lock, so which allows uh, API concurrency at a certain degree. So actually, when a user, uh, when a user runs an a, when a user runs an, a Neutron API, and uh, we just lock the session API session, and uh, we do the Neutron transactions, and we do the key value key, key value operations, and then we will release the lock. So actually this, this is a simple distributed lock and which can help us to coordinate the two type of transactions. And the implementation, the detailed implementation is just like the two-phase commit. So and in the next stage, and we will in, introduce an object synchronization mechanism which can, uh, in, in this mechanism, all the objects stored in both databases are versioned. So currently, the Neutron doesn't have the version objects and uh, both the Dragonflow, so we introduce the version objects for both databases. And we also take advantage of the compare and swap operations of the key value stores, which, which helps update the version. And finally, when something unexpected happens, for example, the Neutron database, the an object in Neutron database is inconsistent with the Dragonflow database and we synchronize the object according to its version. So when we read an uh, object or write object to Neutron database and uh, we read the Neutron object with its version. And then we do compare and swap according to the version and we write to the SDN database. And finally, we notify the 
Dragon for local controller to flash the flaws according to the given update. So with this kind, with this kind of mechanism, and we think that we can we can fix the we we, we, uh, we can guarantee that the two kind of distinct databases are always consistent. So. Uh, hi everyone, uh, we want to discuss the roadmap that we have for the project and leave some time for questions. Uh, so before I go into the roadmap, I want to, uh, to discuss the challenges that uh, led us to develop, to establish this project and uh, what we are facing now in the next uh, releases. So one is the scalability. Currently, with the reference implementation, uh, according to our uh, production and from uh, the production of AW Cloud, we can reach around 500 compute nodes, but this is with uh, pushing the limits and a lot of tweaks to get to that limit. So if you have a massive deployment above that, it won't work. Uh, mainly, it's the message queue, but there's an other limitation. Second one is performance. Uh, the performance of the data path is relatively low because we have a lot of extra uh, software stack for virtual router and namespace <clears throat> going to the DCP, etc. And the, the last one is operability. We took care of some part of the operability, uh, meaning that we don't need to manage a lot of uh, namespace and DCP, but uh, for this release, we did the distributed DNAT, so we took out that part of uh, the reliability, managing the namespace, but we still use centralized SNAT. So one of the features we have for the next road roadmap is uh, to take the namespace for the virtual router all together and to implement the uh, distributed SNAT as well. So. For the scalability, what we are planning and what our roadmap. So currently, with the reference implementation, we are around 500. We are currently in the Mitaka release, testing it. Uh, we're going into bigger and bigger uh, environment and uh, simulating it. We already reached 2,000, but we hope in the next month or two to release the number. So we are almost there for the 2,000 number. Uh, we are doing it, the testing that we are doing currently, we are focused on Redis as the database and Redis as the PubSub mechanism. Uh, for the next release, we, our target of the scalability is to reach 4,000 compute nodes in one pod, meaning in one region, one OpenStack region. Uh, we think it will be with uh, one of the database, we are not sure which, it could be Redis with 0MQ. 0MQ for the PubSub showing uh, a lot of advantages in manner of scale. Uh, we introduced the selective uh, proactive distribution that Gal introduced that allows us to scale even further. Currently we're doing it by the tenant, so we distribute, if a compute node has VMs only on one tenant, it will get the object and the topology of only of that tenant. Of course, we have to exclude the public, uh, public object that uh, like public network between tenants that you need to distribute to everyone. But we are hope in next releases to go into lower level, like uh, Gal show that you have even for one tenant, you have uh, two isolated networks, so they won't sync between the compute node. And for N plus two, we call it, we hope uh, not the uh, Newton release, the release after that, to be able to reach around even 10,000. We think that uh, one major thing that will allow us to do it is move to a, a, re a lazy mode, meaning a reactive model. So we won't distribute all the data to all the nodes, but in lazy mode, pull the data whenever we need it. Of course, we'll pay some latency to do that, but uh, we think, so that's our roadmap of the project. It's very ambitious, we know, but uh, I can for sure say about what, where we stand and uh, in the 2000, we feel very good currently. Uh, 
the roadmap, other roadmap for the project. So for the Mitaka, we have additional DB driver, Zookeeper, Redis, the selective uh, data distribution that uh, Gal covered, and I, I talked it, about it a little bit, the pluggable PubSub mechanism, a pluggable PubSub mechanism allow you for database, for instance, RAM Cloud doesn't have a, a notify option. So for Zookeeper, it doesn't have a notify option, so you can use the PubSub to notify. And as Gal said, if the database support it, you can use it, but what we found out that the database are not optimized to the exact use case we have. And so if we have a PubSub, applicative PubSub, that sends the event, it works much better with lower latency and uh, much more scale. Distributed DNAT is no namespace. It's currently only flows uh, implemented. And security group, uh, security group, we introduce it and we introduce a nice mechanism. Uh, Gal has a blog about it that uh, reduce the number of flows so we don't have flow exactly as the number of a uh, connected port. Uh, we have less than that. Uh, for next release, what are our plans? So hierarchical port binding, I will touch it in a minute. We got a lot of requests for that, uh, mainly for uh, tunneling offloading to the top of the rack, and I will show it in a minute. Uh, containers, and we'll touch it in the next slide as well. Uh, the, we will support the service chaining, the SFC. We are planning to support SFC as the base, but we want to add another type of, we call it topology service injection, so, and I will touch that a little bit further. The inter-cloud inter connectivity L2 gateway is a, like a software emulation using some of the code there is in the OVS, but allow us to, to implement the, the software emulation for a L2 gateway switch and optimize scale and performance. So first of all, with the ML2, so what, what we, we currently are a core plugin in Neutron. We are switching to ML2 mainly to support hierarchical port binding. Uh, the main use case is supporting VLAN up to the top of the rack and offloading the VXLAN tunneling to the, the TOR. Uh, for this, we would have to support another feature, the VLAN segmentation that we don't have. So VLAN will be supported as well for, uh, for the Newton release. This will allow another controller, ODL, or any other SDN controller. This is just an example ODL to control the hardware overlay, the underlay. We want in uh, Dragonfall to focus on the virtual overlay and only on the virtual overlay and the network service distribution. Uh, another feature that we get a lot of requests and we will support for a Newton release is a container support will support nested con nested uh, container inside the VM. We, are, we don't have the spec yet. It will be with a OVS inside the VM and we have an option without it. We want to use the IP VLAN. Maybe we have a lot of option or with a nested uh, OVS. If someone is interested, you can uh, come to the to the IRC meeting and we are now designing it. So it's in design, the container, and we will support, of course, the career integration and uh, support the career driver in, in Dragonflow. So a uh, networking service chain. This is uh, we, from the work session that we did uh, today. We understand this is a very, very important uh, uh, feature. So for sure, we'll support SFC as it is. Uh, we understand that it's something that uh, can drive more ad adoption to, to Dragonflow and it's a needed uh, functionality. But we, other than supporting SFC, we, we want to introduce a, a, new, a new type of service and we call it topology-based uh, service injection and allowing you to bring an SDN application that can be centralized SDN application and can take 
uh, control of part of the user topology and get, of course, in a secure way. We will take care that it doesn't override the other tenants and it doesn't interact with other applications and, and we would do the abstraction that it will, this SDN application cannot uh, touch and uh, interfere with other things, but we want it to be something like surface injection hook. You say, I want my SDN application to be in the router. So it's something similar like IP table as a, the post route, pre route uh, interaction. So you can do it over the user topology. And because we have all, as Gal uh, mentioned earlier, we have all the user topology inside each compute node, we think it's doable. And we didn't define yet the API, how the user will configure it and how he will do it. But we have a lot of use case that are not uh, feasible with the regular SFC and will be feasible with uh, the service injection hooks. Uh, other, other application that we want to support, and this is uh, uh, showing again how you can push the smartness to the edge. Uh, one of them is IGMP application in, I, I don't know all the implementation of the network in the cloud, but some of them, what they do when they want to give a VM multicast, and if you want to want to send the multicast, it's translated on the overlay to broadcast. And it's been broadcast to all the compute nodes or all the hypervisor. The IGMP application is already in a review. We have the spec, we have the code, we didn't merge it yet. So what it basically will do, the, the Dragonflow controller will answer to IGMP join and IGMP live right to the distributed database, which address is listening, and then when someone wants to send on a multicast address, it will send it only to the compute node that SVM that listen on this address. This is for a IPTV or other use cases, mostly telco. We want to support distributed load balancing, but not north-south, east-west. Brute force prevention is already in review. Uh, first of all, uh, we have it for DCP, so the VM cannot compromise the local DCP agent. So we have like rate limiting on the amount of DCP requests that uh, a VM can do in a minute or in a second. Uh, DNS service, it's something that we didn't start it yet, but we hope to start. Currently, the local DCP just provide the DNS address but we think that DNS service and the distributed load balancer, the east-west, go really together, but we didn't finalize it yet. Another interesting application that we are currently developing is the distributed metadata proxy. I don't know if you are all familiar, but currently in the network node, you have a, a distributed metadata proxy that all it does is adding an HTTP header and then going to the Nova a metadata server. So we try to eliminate this service altogether and to have it as another distributed service inside the, the Dragonflow. And fault, uh, port fault detection, we have some idea how to implement uh, via flow port uh, fault detection and, and uh, to have an application for that. Um, so the documentation of Dragonflow is available in our wiki. We have a, a launch pad with bugs and blueprint. We have a weekly IRC meeting, and what we got uh, until now from the work session that we need uh, another time that is good for the uh, North America time zone, so we probably do changing, so one time uh, in a time that is good for China and another time that is good for, for the US, so we will update it soon. Uh, but we are always available in OpenStack uh, Dragonflow, the IRC channel. We have a Vagrant deployment uh, tool that deploys a multiple compute node and one controller, uh, so it's fairly easy to, to test the deployment and start uh, playing with it. Another thing that we try to do, and I think in this point it's still like that, and we are uh, making a lot of effort to leave it like this, is to keep it simple. So if you go into the Dragonflow code, you will see it's very simple. It's not a lot of code. 
and it's all written in Python. So there's the limitation of performance, but it's very easy to, to get involved and to start working in Dragonflow. It's, it's very well abstracted and uh, the, the layer, so if you just want to develop an application, even a, a new application, you can use all the infrastructure and don't worry about uh, DB consistency, I availability, anything. This is being taken care of by the infrastructure. Um, we have the work sessions, so we had two of them already. We have uh, tomorrow uh, two working sessions, and on Friday we have the, the regular uh, um, working session of uh, the development. Uh, we see more and more people in the work session, and of course everyone is invited. In the, in the tomorrow session, we're going to talk about public subscribe next phase, because currently we support only public subscribe. The publisher are only the neutron server. Next step will be that the, we need the a publisher from the compute node as well. So it's multiple publisher, multiple subscriber from the compute node themselves. And we're going to talk about SFC and the and service chaining on the next one. And now if someone has question, we will be happy to answer. So I have a couple of questions, but one is uh, about the NAT stuff. Um, have you guys thought about implementing some kind of a scalable uh, stateless NAT at the edge layer? So stateless NAT, so you could basically have multiple NAT nodes and just load balance between them using layer three ECMP. So, so, so you mean for the S NAT, for the distributed shared well, NAT? Well, mostly for, for floating IPs for, for DNAT, but so it could be used for, for S NAT too, I suppose. For DNAT, we implemented already. So if the compute node, it, you can have, what are you saying that not all the compute node would have I'm a saying you should have a layer at the edge separate from the compute node. So you do NAT at the edge of your cloud. So it's actually possible. It's something that we thought about. But currently, you, you can choose if the compute node, it, if it has an uh, interface on the public network, mm -hmm. he, he can, you can offload the floating IP directly, but uh, we, we, it's actually not uh, so far. I, 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 I think that, that. Uh, that this the approach that you are uh, saying is something that we will do in the yes. SNAT case. Uh, so we'll definitely have something like this. Yeah, the SNAT, what we see, it won't make sense. In the SNAT, it's much more complicated because it's stateful, uh, not and uh, we don't see us distributing it to all the nodes. Mm. But uh, it's an interesting use case, and if you want uh, to, uh, we should think about it uh, for DNAT as well. Currently, DNAT is uh, basically only dealing with the, mm -hmm. the local compute node offloading. So for the distributed DNAT, don't you have to have sort of kind of a shared uh, VLAN across all racks then? a shared layer two basically across all racks to bring that down to the compute nodes, right? That external network. You need public network connectivity. Yes, yeah, yes. But it has to be a shared layer two, right? Why shared? You, you uh, floating IPs, you attach it to one instance, right? One VM. Right, but the layer two broadcast domain. Yes, we need, yes. It needs yes. to be shared, so that's yes. kind of, do you want to have like a pure, like yeah, it, ma it makes Layer sense what you suggested. We, it could be our next step. We, we need to think about it. Currently, yeah. we develop it f only for the local compute node, but it makes sense to have like some edge devices that serve multiple mm -hmm. compute nodes, maybe in the rack or... Okay. Yeah. And uh, last question. Is, is it production ready as it stands today? It, uh, it's very close to it. What we are doing now is test, and we didn't uh, release them, but we are doing data path tests that show really good result, and uh, a controlled plain test. And it's uh, in the process to be pushed to a testing pod in uh, our company, Public Cloud. So uh, it, it, and uh, AWS Cloud is looking for pushing it, so it's on the verge of production ready, and uh, it's currently being tested for production. 
Uh, hi, uh, it appears to me that you have two layers of uh, pluggable database. One is at the controller, the other at the compute nodes. Is that correct? Uh, no. What we have is, the, well, basically there is the, the database, um, what you have is the database solution, then you have clients, right? You have clients on all your compute nodes for the I controllers see. reading this, and you have the same client on the Neutron server writing okay. all the changes. So, so now on the con control side, I understand the rationale of using a NoSQL or key value store. Do you customize the, the hashing mechanism to somehow more intelligently map you know, the tenant network state versus which shard this state goes to? Or you just blindly you know, do a consistent hashing? This is something we discussed about uh, doing using, uh, I guess, the shredding, you mean? Yeah. Uh, we are planning to do this based on the topology. So the selective proactive is going to be something. We are going to uh, basically shred it according to tenants or according to, to the topology. But it's not uh, there yet. No, the, the topology is but. But are you asking about consistency? No, I'm no, asking about, about uh, you know, eventually when you scale out, right, you will determine which state goes to which shard or which yes, node. Yes, yes. So you can do it blindly, which may have implications, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can do it in a more topology aware way, yes. uh, which can give you more um, scale out capabilities. Yes, so yes. currently we do it by the project, the, the tenant ID, but we hope to drill down more. Okay, thanks. Are there any other questions? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I had the same one about when one of your PPTs, you had the database and the compute node. So that's, I had the same question. Thanks for asking. So there is only one database on the controller side, right? So the other question I had was, what is the cost of your distributed log? Isn't it limiting your scalability? Okay, I, I, I let uh, Mali implemented that, so it will be best. So, but we ju it's just the first phase. Yeah, yeah, the, the distributed phase. lock is just the first phase, and in the next release, and we plan to use the version object to get rid of the lock problem. So currently, we use the distributed lock because it is easy to implement, and it uh, guarantees, uh, it helps guarantees uh, API atomicity. To make, to make sure the two databases has the same data committed to the to the two to the two, two, two database, but it is just the first phase. And, so. and also, I think in terms of scale, the the main issue is how you distribute this information to all the local controllers. It's less about uh, the Neutron API to the to the database. This is essentially mostly. Uh, the, most of the loads uh, from OpenStack to the database is about reads, usually from Horizon or from uh, Nova. Uh, so we haven't yet, I think, saw any bottlenecks on the API. And we use the database itself as the mechanism to do the distributed log, the, the SQL database. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask another question? So uh, you. So I assume that in the, um, the controller database, you're only holding the abstract topology information, right? You're not uh, yes. holding, like in the OVN, you're holding pretty much a mapping of the uh, o uh, open flow um, configurations. R R right now we are holding uh, the topology, as you say, but again, in the next phases, we see a lot of applications that could use this to uh, distribute other information. So, so my question is, how, how big a data are we talking about? So this gentleman talking about 2,000 no, uh, two thousand nodes, how, how, how large does it translate into? Because it's not uh, so large. It's yeah. not so large, right? Yes. So now what's the need of scale out uh, at that database layer? Okay. Would uh, I be fine if I just do a MySQL with multiple read won't. replicas? Because the number of clients. So it's uh, uh, even, even some of the a NoSQL database that we tested have a problem scaling out to hundreds and thousand nodes. So only some of them nodes who handle this really good. And when you want to have high number of clients, then you need something that is no, no, not centralized and, no, in, uh, and it's uh, like NoSQL. Are you talking about mostly the read? Uh, 
transactions yes, or you're more yes. concerned about if it's read uh, let's say you can scale out the read of MySQL right uh, the, by adding from, from thousands of nodes it's almost impossible no I'm asking so so I remember at some point in the presentation and, and it's uh, not, not only read it will be right because we would have to add the port status and okay the, Currently, we don't uh, put port status and multicast information I and see. other information. Currently, from the compute node, we just write the chassis ID once the, the hypervisor come up. But later, we would have to add, uh, okay. do a lot of write from the compute node themselves. But, but even for read, we found out that it's okay. very hard without some kind of cache layer that this NoSQL okay. provide. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.